quarterback prospects that once broke the mold now seemingly are the mold in today's NFL. Gone are the days of statuesque pocket passers that can't run worth a damn in favor of fast, agile, new age gunslingers that are both creative in space and versatile within a modern playbook. This is without a doubt the era of the mobile spread quarterback, and I think the fact that the league is so firmly committed to that trend is what makes my evaluation of Ohio State's Dwayne Haskins so interesting. He's not like a lot of other young prospects that have come out of college in the last few years, or even other young prospects that have come out of his own school. He's not fast, he's not agile, he's not someone who can make a lot of ridiculous off-platform throws when a play breaks down, and he's not even the kind of athlete that you can design a lot of rushing plays for to expand your offense. He's very much a mold breaker in his own right because he harkens back to five or six years ago when the mold for quarterback still was being a methodical, surgical passer from the pocket. Hell, if I were to compare Haskins to any other young quarterbacks in the league today, it would probably be sort of a less mobile hybrid between Jared Goff and Jimmy Garoppolo because he shares most of his best traits with both of them. For the Garoppolo comparison in particular, just like Jimmy G, Haskins' play style revolves around distributing the ball with tempo and rhythm. Everything he does on the field, other than running, of course, is fast. He processes defenses extremely quickly, his release mechanics are very tight and compact, so he gets the ball out faster than most other quarterbacks, and he's a great anticipatory passer that throws to spots on the field rather than to the receivers themselves. I'll show you an example of that on this third and nine against Purdue, because I feel like if there was any play that described Haskins in a nutshell, it's probably this one. Ohio State has four receivers on the field against a nickel defense, so they know that if it is man coverage, one of these safeties is going to have to be handling KJ Hill in the slot. Haskins motions Hill across the formation, which then draws a rotation from the safeties down to cover him, and that's the red flag that OSU is looking for to tell them that it is indeed man coverage. The defense being in man is a good thing though, because the play call itself is a variation of a mesh concept, which just so happens to be the perfect call against man coverage on third down. All of these little crossing routes are great for breaking man quickly, especially when they can get defenders running into each other. So all Haskins has to do is just hold that high safety in the middle of the field with his eyes so that he does not bracket Hill's crossing route and take it away, while also of course surviving the pressure in the pocket long enough so that he can get the ball to Hill once that route fully develops. He does both of those things beautifully, gets the pass off with pressure in his face, and moves the chains on a critical third down. On the end zone angle in particular, it's especially apparent how all the little things on this play came together, because at least to me, from behind Haskin's perspective, his polish as a prospect jumps off the screen even more. Before the snap, you can see the man coverage ID on the motion check, and after the snap, he's got good enough eye discipline to not stare downhill so that the safety will not look to bracket him. Then while he's got his eyes down the field on that safety, he sees the pressure coming up the middle, so he subtly steps up into a soft spot away from it, while simultaneously also listening to that alarm clock in the back of his head that's telling him Hill is about to come open on the crosser, which again, he's not even looking at. He just knows the timing of this play so well that he knows he should be coming open right about now. So with that pressure still in his face in a collapsing pocket, he uses that quick release to get the pass off on time to the spot where Hill will be, not where he is, and it's a perfect ball that's caught on time and in rhythm to convert a first down. I know it's only a 9 or 10 yard gain, but there's a lot going on here. Coverage identification before the snap, eye discipline after the snap, pocket presence to feel pressure coming and avoid it, release mechanics to get the ball out quickly and accurately, trust and chemistry with receivers for them to get to the right spot at the right time, and of course the toughness to do all of that while also knowing that you're about to get f***ing obliterated by a free rusher the moment that ball leaves your hand. This play wasn't flashy and it wasn't a big gain, but you can be damn sure that it got my attention because it showed everything that I want to see in a franchise quarterback. Decision making, instincts, and toughness. That's what Dwayne Haskins is all about, and that's why he's so exceptionally effective at shredding defenses with short throws underneath. Everything he does is quick, and defenses just can't keep up with his eyes or his release. In fact, out of all the major quarterback prospects to come out of college in the last four years, Haskins has the highest percentage of throws either behind the line of scrimmage or within the first 10 yards. He's so far ahead of everyone else that only three other quarterbacks even come within 5% of his numbers, those being Pat Mahomes, Josh Rosen, and Paxton Lynch. And when compared to his 2019 classmate, Kyler Murray, he's a full 15% higher on his short throw percentage, which is an insane difference. 
Haskins owns the short area of the field. That's where he does almost all of his damage. And whoever his next head coach in the NFL is, I think they should play to that strength. I think they should surround him with premier yards after catch threats that can turn short gains into long ones because that's exactly what he was able to have success with at Ohio State. Now, does that mean that if I were his future team, would I trade away whatever true deep speed I did have on the roster just because Haskins tends to work underneath more often? No, because Dwayne still does have a cannon for an arm and he can still make use of a true deep threat just like any other quarterback. He might not do it as often, but he can still do it. Believe me on that one. But let's just pretend that his future team, whoever they may be, did not think that they needed any deep speed on the roster anymore. Again, for whatever stupid f***ing reason they might give. While that hypothetical trade may be annoying and a bad decision in my opinion, it's still probably not the end of the world. Dwayne can dink and dunk you to death with the best of them, even without a true deep threat to draw attention. So as long as he's got, oh, I don't know, a good interior offensive line, particularly at the guard position, and four different receiving options that can all split time in the slot, well, he'll be fine. It's not ideal, obviously, but he's got the skill set to make that work. That's all not to say that Haskins is a prospect without any flaws, though, because he does have some very distinct problems, obviously first starting with that lack of mobility. He needs that good offensive line because he doesn't have the speed or quickness to cover up for a bad one like Deshaun Watson, Josh Allen, and Russell Wilson have all done in the past. And of course, he also does not give you the freedom to consistently call stuff like zone reads or options or anything like that because no defenses are actually afraid of him as a runner. In fact, I'd venture to say that if there was ever someone who could be called a complete polar opposite to Lamar Jackson last year, it's probably Dwayne Haskins this year. But beyond that, Haskins also has a terrible tendency to throw one or two passes every game that I like to call what the f passes, meaning he throws them and then I shout what the f are you doing at the screen. It seems to me at least that on those throws he's moving so quickly through his reads and pulling that trigger so fast on the first throw he sees that he doesn't really let his eyes catch up and he's not fully processing what he's actually seeing on the field. I'll show you an example of that so that it makes a little bit more sense, again from that same Purdue game that we looked at earlier. It's 2nd and 10 here, and not wanting to get shredded once more on those crossing routes, Purdue is giving a 2 deep zone look this time. From this alignment, they can play cover 2, they can play cover 4, they can roll into some sort of single high zone look if they want to, or in true Purdue fashion, they can just blitz the hell out of Haskins and try to bait him into a mistake, which they did quite a bit in this game. Before the snap, you could see the receiver, Paris Campbell, pointing out that the corner is coming on a blitz because he was lined up suspiciously far inside from Campbell, which tipped off the pressure, but Haskins wasn't worried about it because he knew that he had a six-man protection on and that the running back, Mike Weber, would pick that up. So in the back of Haskins' mind, he knows that if Purdue brings pressure from the boundary side with that corner, A, it's going to get blocked fairly easily, and B, he knows that Campbell is going to be curling up his route at the sticks to give Haskins a quick outlet because the safety is so far down the field that he wouldn't be able to stop it anyway. This is what's called a side adjust, and it's used all the time to beat blitzes like this when receivers are left uncovered behind the pressure. However, what Haskins failed to account for was this wheel linebacker right here. As a quarterback, you have to be aware that just because defenses are blitzing you with corners off the edge doesn't mean that they're always going to be leaving receivers completely unguarded. In a lot of zone blitz designs, the defenders that are responsible for dropping into coverage, especially linebackers, are not just going to drop to a spot and sit there. They know that usually the ball will be out quick on a side adjustment to the uncovered receiver, so to them, their jobs are really simple, because all they have to do is just run directly at that uncovered receiver and take away the easy, automatic read from the quarterback. For some reason, Haskins put the cart way far ahead of the horse on this play. He read the pressure, he got excited because he knew it was getting picked up, and he knew that he had Campbell all alone in space, but he never checked any of these other defenders at the snap to see if they were baiting him the whole time. Purdue wanted him to make that throw. They counted on him seeing that pressure so quickly that he would not see anything else, and Haskins damn near gifted them a pick six as a result. He's extraordinarily lucky that it bounced off the linebacker's hands instead, because this horribly ugly game should have been a hell of a lot uglier. If you want to know how Purdue's defense, which gave up 30 points a game, mind you, somehow blew the doors off Ohio State, this is how. 
They committed to stopping the edge run game with Weber. They studied Haskins' tendencies on tape. They knew they could bait him into really dumb mistakes when he would speed read defenses. And then by the second half, after enough of those mistakes were compounded on each other, there was just no amount of digging that could get Dwayne out of that hole. Obviously, I don't think that these weekly what the f throws are a big enough deal to completely sink him as a prospect. But when he does get to the NFL, it is absolutely priority number one for his new coaching staff to fix that. I know that he loves to operate quickly, and I know that he loves to use pace and tempo to keep defenses off balance while he tears them up on short throws, but at some point, NFL defenses are going to figure that out, and believe me, they're a hell of a lot better at fooling young quarterbacks than Purdue is. Overall, I think it would benefit Haskins to sit on the bench, at least for a little while, because I think he could really stand to benefit from learning from a veteran how to make coverage identifications and call protections at the next level, how to read post-snap coverage roles if defenses are changing the picture on him at the last second, and most importantly, getting used to having full command of an offense all by himself without Ryan Day being in his ear and changing the plays for him at the line. I don't know if he's prepared to take on all of that responsibility from day one, because again, he is very inexperienced as a starter. But the good news is that despite his inexperience at Ohio State, we saw him get noticeably better in almost every aspect of his game throughout the season. We know he's an extremely coachable kid, and we know that given enough time, he's gonna put in the work necessary to learn all that he needs to learn. We just have to give him a real chance to do so before throwing him to the wolves. Of course, he's not where he needs to be yet, but I have all the confidence in the world that Dwayne will get there eventually, and that's what matters. He's got the big arm, he's got the quick release, he's got the instincts, and he's got the toughness. Does he lack mobility outside the pocket? Yes. Will he make at least two throws a game that are at best flirting with disaster and at worst taking that disaster out on a third date? Also yes. But to me, if you can show all the traits that he did at OSU, flaws and all, and still have so much room to grow under a real NFL coaching staff, it's hard for me not to fall in love with Haskins as a prospect. He is not a quarterback that fits the modern mold in today's NFL, but that's okay. If I'm a GM, I don't need him to fit the mold, I just need him to fit my mold for my team. Leadership on the sideline, toughness in the pocket, and accuracy to my playmakers in space. Not every roster is built to play around a quarterback like that, but I'm sure that at least one of them out there still is. I can only hope, for Dwayne's sake at least, that when draft night comes on April 25th, that one perfect fit does the right thing. And speaking of perfect fits, I think our sponsor this week, Manscaped, thought you guys were a perfect fit for them because apparently the response you gave them in their last sponsorship was incredible and they immediately came right back and wanted more. So thank you so much for making it worth their while to support this channel. They are still growing extremely fast, just like me, in the men's grooming market ever since they went on Shark Tank to pitch this exact same kit that they sent me. It comes with a really strong waterproof cordless trimmer that has a ceramic blade so it won't cut you, a bunch of different size guides for different lengths for whatever you want. It's got a safety razor, which gives you a much closer and smoother shave, and it's also way cheaper as well because I can buy literally 100 replacement razors for this thing for under 10 bucks. If I was gonna buy the same amount of replacement heads for my old disposable, it would probably be 10 or 20 times that cost, so that savings right there will eventually eventually pay for the kit all by itself. It also comes with the best smelling body wash that I've ever used according to my wife, so I actually gotta get more of that now that I think about it because I'm running low. Uh, it's got a cologne, anti-chafing aloe, of course the case to put it all in, I mean literally anything you can think of that a guy might need for grooming and maintenance, this kit has it. And I've used it every single day since they sent it to me. So. If you want to get one for yourself, or maybe for someone else that you know that is in desperate need of manscaping, head on down to that link in the description below, enter promo code BRETT20 for 20% off your order, and free shipping. I promise you won't regret it. And as for me, of course, I will be back again next week with the last prospect breakdown of the draft season before I release my annual mock draft special. This one's on Kyler Murray. I know he's probably the most anticipated prospect I'll break down all year, so I'm kind of saving the best for last year. And as a reminder, I've also got my first prospect rankings by position also coming out this week exclusively for all my patrons. So keep an eye out for that as well if you are a member of my Patreon. I'm hoping to get that out on Friday. So with that, thank you again for watching and I'll see you all again next week. Later.